My name is Owen Egan and I am the West Hartford Probate Court Judge. Welcome to today's show, The Probate Court and You. Thank you for tuning in to our program. This is a monthly program to de designed to teach the public about the probate court and what it does. We hope by the end of this evening you will have answered a question about uh, some general questions about adoptions in the probate court. With me here tonight is uh, Attorney Carla Zahner. Good evening. Good evening. Carla is a graduate of Trinity College and also the University of Connecticut School of Law. She has practiced law in this area for over 10 years and she has a great experience in the family practice and also with adoptions. Uh, she currently serves as, a, as an attorney with the law offices of Freed Marcroft in Hartford, Connecticut. That's and she is, as I said, as an expert in family law, which includes, among other things, adoptions. Thank you so much for that gracious introduction. <laughs> well, welcome. Uh, as I said, we are here tonight to talk about adoptions, but first a little background about the probate court. Probate court handles a wide range of uh, uh, matters, including matters affecting children and the elderly uh, and persons with intellectual disabilities, as well as, well as those with psychiatric disabilities. The probate court also handles decedents' estates, conservatorships, guardianships, name changes, termination of parental rights, commitments, and the list goes on. We are here tonight, obviously, to talk about adoptions, and the probate court deals with adoptions as well. There are 54 probate courts in the state of Connecticut. Uh, they are regional courts. West Hartford happens to be its own region, and so we're lucky uh, we, we have our own probate court here in the town of West Hartford. The clerk's office is located on the third floor of the uh, uh, town hall, and the uh, probate court is conducted in the council chambers, which is just across the way. The clerk's office is open from 8.30 to 4.30 p.m. every day. Please stop by and meet our friendly staff, and our, 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 our staff would be happy to help you or assist you with any matter that uh, you might have. They're very compassionate and they're very kind. Uh, we are here today to learn about adoptions in the probate court. Today we will discuss adoptions involving minor children, and if we have time, we'll address adoptions of adults. Uh, yes, there are adoptions of adults that are allowed under Connecticut law. In general, to complete an adoption, there are two steps. Uh, those, those steps are essential. The first is an agreement to give and receive a child in adoption, and the second is that you must obtain approval of the probate court and that must be from the probate court having jurisdiction over the matter. This is required because custody is never absolute and it cannot be bargained away or disposed of without uh, a probate court ruling. Uh, it should also be noted that if a child who is being adopted is over the age of 12, that it is necessary to obtain that child's consent with regard to the adoption. So Carla, you have done many adoptions in the state of Connecticut over the past 10 years, is that correct? That's right. Some in front of you, Judge Egan. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you know, uh, we know all cases are different. Can you briefly describe the process to the public using an example of one of your last cases? Sure. Um, I just want to start by saying that adoptions, uh, the work I do with adoptions is some of my favorite work. Um, it's mostly positive and it's nice to, to have that experience with individuals where you feel like you're making a difference and helping them attain a goal. Um, if you're asking me for an example, um, I, can, I can think of a few, but I'll, I'll pick one. Um, the example of a same-sex married couple, um, two women who came to me when they were trying to conceive their child. Fast forward, they um, and they were using an unknown donor, which is important. Um, and I'll talk about why that's important in a little bit. They used an unknown donor, had the, they, uh, one mother was the gestational mother. Um, they got pregnant. She brought the children to term. She had the babies. They were very, very sick. Um, they didn't know if the children were gonna make it. Fast forward, the children with a lot of help and Bo both mothers were very, very involved with the health and well-being and taking care of these children. Um, finally, they came to me. We prepared an adoption packet. Um, that's, what we, that's what we do at Freed Marcroft. Um, it's, it 
it has a ton of information about it, uh, about the parties in that packet. Um, and the reason why there is an adoption, an adoption is necessary in that case is because, so there's one biological parent and then there's the other parent that is, is still a parent and there is a presumption of, of paternity in Connecticut when you have a child within a marriage. Um, however, that presumption is rebuttable and in the instance of a same-sex couple, uh, it's rebuttable by biology. So in the wake of political events, um, it, it, in the instance that people want an ironclad, ironclad way to protect their, their paternity of a child, they, the non-biological parent must adopt. So I brought these people to um, a court, I don't wanna say which one, um, and we prepared a, an adoption packet where the non-bio mom was requesting to adopt the children. Um, and it was an emotional process for them because they had been through so much with the children. Uh, the children were so sick and they kept asking me, Carla, why do we have to do this? Why does she have to adopt a child? She's already a mother. She's been in the trenches with me. She's changed the feeding tubes. She's done everything. And all I could say was, well, we have to be able to protect your your rights to that child in the event, God forbid, that the bio mom passes away, in the event of a divorce. And that's why that's why the adoption in that instance was very, very important. Excellent. Adoptions are also my favorite cases as well. They're happy. Uh, they're, they're happy events and they're, uh, people, people are very, very uh, warm and loving and it's wonderful to see them. Yep, if uh, I may circle back um, to why it was important that they had a, an unknown sure. donor. So they used a donor from um, a, a sperm bank and that part was important because in that instance, in that adoption, we didn't need to terminate a, a, the, the a known donor's rights. Very important. Uh, that's very important. Yep. So that's just an ad added layer that, um, that that I do at times when, when people use a known donor, I do have to terminate that person's rights. And I've only ever done it uh, with consent for the termination, um, but there are cases where there, there is no consent. And there's a termination hearing? That's correct. And if we have time, we'll get into that right. later. Yep. Okay. Um, now, Carla, there are four types of adoptions involving minor children. Statutory parent adoption, step-parent adoption, relative adoption and a co-parent adoption. Co-parent and step-parent are very similar, correct? That's right. And can you help the audience by defining at least some of those four uh, types of adoptions and I can work on sure. any of the others sure. that you don't discuss? Yep, I can talk about a, a statutory parent. Um, statutory parent would be in, in the event uh, of a DCF case, for example, if they're doing an abuse and neglect investigation and the, the rights of the biological parents are terminated, DCF steps in as the parent to that child until that child ultimately becomes adopted by mm -hmm. either a blood relative or a foster family or what have you. For that interim period of time, DCF is considered the statutory parent. Could be that there's no living parents as well. That's right. And, and, or, and or that the parents' rights have been terminated. That's right. Thank you. The next is uh, um, step-parent. Do you want to discuss that? Uh, I can talk about step-parent adoption. Uh, it's similar to the case that I just talked about, and that's considered a step-parent adoption in same-sex cases. It's also in the cases where um, e either with consent or without consent, there's a parent that is going to have their parental rights terminated or consent to having them terminated and then the person that is married to the biological parent steps in and adopts that child and becomes legally, financially responsible for the welfare of that child. The key being that uh, termination of the parental rights comes first and then, and then the step parent can, can adopt at that point. That's right, that's the most important step because without that the step parent can't adopt. And then the co-parent, as you said, is like as, as as you've said, is like the the step-parent adoption. Co-parent uh, also has the right to adopt after um, uh, parental rights have been uh, terminated. Is that correct? That's right. All right. And the co-parent adoption, I think, came into being after the Baby Z case. Are you familiar with that? 
Yes. That was in 1999? Yep. And, that, and do you want to talk about that briefly? I'll let, I'll let you handle that one. Um, the Baby Z case, uh, a same-sex couple wanted to adopt, and they weren't permitted to adopt um, because of that legislation was passed allowing same-sex couples to adopt. That's and right. you, you used that as an example. Yep. And since then, the co-parent uh, adoption has uh, been uh, legalized in the state of Connecticut. Legalized and flourished. Just demographics. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been flourishing, so that's good to hear. With the step-parent and the co-parent adoptions, we're gonna, I'm going to ask you about a home study and an investigation. DCF generally does a home study or an investigation in situations where a child is being adopted, but in those two instances, uh, the court may deviate from that, and they don't necessarily have to order a, an investigation or home study. Isn't that correct? Right, and that's our goal as part of our representation of, of parties is to have that home study waived due to the circumstances. And what so do you do to have that home study waived? We, we, um, we have a, a, it's a lot of work and a lot of documentation and information is key. So we try to give the probate judges as much information as possible to make, uh, um, to ascertain that, that the parties involved are um, going to, if the adoption goes through, it will be in the best interest of the child, that the children are going to a solid home, that they will have food and all of their basic needs met. Um, it, it's that they have loving collateral contacts that can attest to uh, the desire of these individuals to adopt the children or the child. Um, so it's just, it's a lot of information. And I find that the more information, the more robust you can make that, the better off your clients are. It, it, it helps the court in making the decision as to whether to, to uh, have the investigation done right. or not. Um, That's a big determination that the court is making to say that a home study isn't needed, so they need as much information as possible upon which to base that. Correct. From a judge's standpoint, you're very cautious. You want to make sure that the child is protected. And as you, as you just stated, it's in the best in, what's in the best interest of the child. Um, you, you, you don't want to ever put a child in, in a situation where they might be harmed. And so the court is stepping very cautiously as they, as they go forward with these adoptions. Right. Um, and the investigation generally helps them with that, but to waive it is a big step. It's a big step, and it's an important step that if, if I as an attorney can, can meet that for my clients, then it's a home run for me. Great. Um, the last is a relative adoption. Uh, do you want to discuss a little bit about a relative adoption? Sure. Um, so relative adoption, same situation. The termination has to take place first. Um, it, I'll give you the example of um, a case where DCF has become the statutory parent. Um, and hypothetically speaking, there's a blood relative that wants to step in and adopt that child. Th that blood relative will be given preference. It doesn't mean it's a slam dunk per se, but um, relative adoption is when somebody who's biologically related to the child wants to adopt the child in the event that the bio parent's rights are terminated. Right. And in that instance, the DCF is a statutory parent, and they can place the child with, with anyone. It could be a relative or it could be a non-relative. That's right. Correct. And then with a relative adoption, uh, I'll give you an example. A grandmother becomes a guardian of a child because, uh, God forbid, the parents have passed away, and uh, the grandmother is, is now gar the guardian of the child. The grandmother herself can present the child for adoption, and she can actually uh, name herself as the, the adoptive parent in the petition to the court, and, and she can, she can uh, then adopt the child. That's right. If, if, uh, if, if that's what she cho chooses to do. And she has to prove that it would be in the best interest of the child and that she is, in fact, a blood relative. And Always. She has to meet Always. those threshold matters as well. Um, jurisdiction. How do we determine where the application for an adoption must be filed? This one's tricky because people always, they always get confused about this and, it, and it's, it's where the adopting party resides. That is the jurisdiction. That is the probate court that you want to go to. And if it's a statutory parent, it's where the statutory parent has offices. That's and right. And that could be in multiple. That's a really important distinction, actually. Could be in multiple locations. That's right. Right. Um, Carla, when is the minor child free for adoption? After the uh, parental rights have been terminated. 
Okay, so let's talk just briefly about the termination of parental rights. We don't have a lot of time here. Right. Um, That's not the most pleasant part. No, it is not. <laughs> um, if it's done on a consent basis, it's pleasant. It's fine. Uh, and, and, and often you do it on a consent basis, is that correct? Most of the time on a consent basis, okay. yeah. Okay, so let's, let's deal with that one second. Let's deal with the, in, a, in a contested case where a parent's rights have to be terminated. Can you t talk to the audience about what happens in, in those cases? So in a contested case, um, the best interest of the child is, is still the standard. Um, the, the parent whose parental rights are being terminated, um, there are certain findings that the court has to make, um, and the court has to uh, give that person a right to testify, has to be, that person has to be represented by an attorney, that person has a right to um, have witnesses and present their case. So uh, someone's parental rights can't be terminated. Um, it's not, it, it's, a, it's a very serious proceeding and, and they d genuinely get a, a chance to, to defend their, their rights to that child. Right, there's a higher standard for the court to make the decision. Um, they use a clear and convincing standard. Uh, before before taking away the rights of, of someone. A GAL may be appointed, a guardian ad litem may be appointed for the minor child so that the minor can be represented and they can, they can represent the child's interests and de desires. And if, if I may just interject right there, mm -hmm. so the, the guardian ad litem is a very important piece of it because the court won't make a decision in a vacuum. So it won't make a decision, uh, uh, you know, regarding someone's parental rights without having a third party opine on what is in that child's best interest. Typically, anyway, the court will not. So the guardian ad litem is really important because that's the individual who the court entrusts to present with to present evidence with regard to what is in that child's best interest. And the guardian will will speak to the parties, will speak to collateral contacts and do their due diligence in order to make their recommendations to the court. Right. And the court's looking for two two things. The court is looking to establish by clear and looking for the parties to establish by clear and convincing evidence that the termination is in the best interest of the child, which you you mentioned, and second that the child has either been neglected, abused, uh, abandoned, or some somehow mistreated by the parents whose rights are being terminated. That's right. And then, as you properly uh, mentioned. The parent whose rights are being sought to uh, the parent whose rights are being terminated, if they're if they're to be terminated, uh, must be canvassed, and the court has to make sure uh, it's almost like a Miranda warning that they have a right to an attorney, that they have a right that they're reminded that they have a right to present evidence to defend themselves, that they have a right to confront witnesses, um, that they, they have a right to bring in evidence on their on their own, testify on their own behalf, and that if they don't testify their failure to testify will, will be looked at uh, adversely and in fact the court will draw an adverse inference and use that against them. Once they're warned of that by the court, then it's up to them to decide whether they want an attorney and whether they want to proceed with presenting evidence, cross-examining witnesses, etc. Right, and if so they can't afford an attorney, the court will appoint one. Right. It's a very serious, it's a very serious matter, as you said, and it's, it's uh, very important that before someone's rights are taken away, that they've been afforded all those opportunities to defend themselves. Um, so if the court finds, after the presentation of that evidence, that it is in the best interest of the, of the child to have the parent's rights terminated and that, that the parent in some way has neglected, abused, abandoned, or somehow injured the, injured the child, um, then the court will make that decision that uh, they no longer have their rights. That's right. Uh, that's in a contested case. So let's let's go to the easier case now. Uh, can you describe an uncontested uh, termination of parental rights? Uh, uncontested terminations are are um, it, it, I mostly do them in in the example of a same sex adoption. So in in those instances, it's actually a very pleasant experience because we have someone who is probably a family member who um, knew from the beginning that they were. They were, they were a sperm donator, but that they did not want to be a parent to that child. Um, so in those instances, they're, they're canvassed by the judge to make sure that they understand that they were, are forever relinquishing their rights um, to the child or the children. Um, and that's the most important aspect is, is the actual canvassing of the individual that they understand that the decision they're making to consent to their termination is, isn't one that they can go back and have heard again.
it's, it's a final decision. And again, the court looks at what's in the best interest of the child, right. uh, and they use the clear and convincing standard, and then they determine whether um, the consent was voluntarily and knowingly given by the person who's giving up their rights to the child. Right. So again, very serious, but much easier because they're consenting to it, and, and uh, it goes much more smoothly. That's I right. Think. Yeah, that's great. Um, and then after, after the decision is made, the court has to wait 20 days uh, for, for the appeal period to run before the adoption can occur. Right. Uh, now, Carla, we've reviewed the four types of adoption, statutory parent, step-parent, co-parent, and relative adoption. Let's talk about the DCF investigation or home study. And we mentioned that the home study I is required with the statutory parent and the relative adoption. Uh, the home study can be ordered by the court in the step-parent or co-parent adoption, but your, your goal as the advocate for your client is to, to present enough evidence to the judge so that the judge determines that no, uh, the, the, the home study is not, is not needed. Well, let's talk about the cases where the home study uh, is needed, either good cause is shown in those step-parent or co-parent parent, uh, adoptions or in the statutory or relative uh, parent adoptions. Um, the DCF study is also called a home study, correct? That's right. And, and can you tell the viewing audience what the home study is? Sure, sure I can. Um, and I, just so you know, I always tell my clients when, when DCF is involved, you know, a, a lot of people get indignant. Why am I being looked at this mm -hmm. way? Of course I can provide a healthy home for this child. Of course I can financially provide. And, and, I, and I tell people to try to put those feelings in a little box and put it aside because it doesn't matter. Um, to the extent that DCF is involved, you have to acquiesce to the process and, and put your best foot forward. So yes, they're going to come to your home. They're going to look through the rooms of your home. They're going to look and see if the child will have his or her own room. They're going to look and see, um, they're going to ask collateral contacts about you. They're going to make sure that you're going to be able to take care of that child and you have a pediatrician lined up and, and you know which school district the child will be enrolled in and you've done your due diligence. You can't just say you want to be a parent. You have to prove it. Um, and to the extent that you want to adopt that child, you should be more than willing and, and ready to do that and prove that to DCF. Um, it can be as grueling of an experience or, or, or as easy as of an experience as the, the people want. And I find that more cooperation leads to uh, more expeditious results. Sure. So sure. My, my advice is always to just fully cooperate, fully cooperate, right. give them what they want, do it in a timely fashion, and, and you'll get the answer that you want. Well, the, the judge that's sitting and, and ruling on the case is just seeing it for the first time. They have no knowledge of the parties that are before them. And right. the judge is looking at what's in the best interest of the child. And they want, I, I know from my, my standpoint, and I'm sure from other judges' standpoint, they want to make sure that, that that child is protected and make sure that the child is going to a good home. So the D DCF study, which is very thorough, is very helpful right. to the court. I can review it, or the judges can review it in advance. I, being one of the judges, can review it in advance. And I can just give you an example of what's in those reports. Um, most recent one that I, I looked at has a presentation, the physical description of the, of the parent uh, that is going to adopt and how that parent interacts with family members. Family origin, that fam where, where, that, where that parent uh, lines up in his family, in her family. Educational and employment history of where that, where that parent went to school, where he or she has worked. Um, previous marriage of that, of that man or woman. Uh, who were they married to? What is their relationship with that man or woman? Is it good? Is it bad? Uh, health and hobbies, what do they do in their spare time? Background clearances. Right. They check with the police and see whether they've been cleared through DCF. If there's any abuse there, there's a problem. If the state police find a criminal history or abuse, there's a problem. And, and it's something the court wants to know about. Uh, marital relationship, how is their marital relationship among the, the couple that's adopting? Religion, finances is also it, it reviewed. Uh, fertility versus infertility of the, right. of the parents. It's very, very thorough. Chil children in the home are interviewed. So if, right. if this ch adopted child is coming to their, their house, they want to know about these children, whether these children might abuse or do something to the child that might be harmful. Uh, uh, the the uh, parenting education, as you said, how, they, how they've prepared themselves to be a parent, what schools are, are, is the child going to go to, child rearing skills, 
Uh, personal references are also helpful, which I think come in your packets when you, when you send them to the court. A description of the family home physically. Yep. And then finally, the approval and recommendation. They make a final approval. And obviously, if DCF does an approval, that has a, a huge impact. If they say we don't approve, that has a huge impact as well. Right. So, have you, so uh, I'll ask you a question. Have you ever approved an adoption where DCF hasn't given the recommendation? No, I haven't. Okay. I haven't, but I haven't had one okay. yet. I, I haven't, I've only been uh, working for about uh, maybe, maybe a year and a half now, and I haven't seen one. I've done okay. about four, four adoptions, four or five adoptions, all very interesting, but no, I haven't seen that. Okay. Um, and and uh, so after DCF does their, does their investigation, what happens then? We go to court. We right? go to court. So, yep. so the, the and DCF comes and it's a party. Yeah, <laughs> and then and then the probate court has a hearing on the adoption. That's right. This is after the termination hearing has been done and the appeal periods run, and then the court reviews the re reviews the evidence, uh, including the investigation or home study. That's a happy day. Yeah, that's what we hope, right? right. That's great. And then they enter the final order or decree approving whether uh, wh or as to whether or not to approve the adoption. Um, and then again, it's the best interest of the child that's being focused on uh, predominantly. And then uh, there's one final thing, the child's name. What happens with the child's name? So you can, that's the time to make the decision about the, a name change for the child. So if you want to adopt the child and you want to change his or her name, you can do that at, at the probate court. So you can change the first and the last name. That's right. Of the child. Okay. And Carla, um, thank you for helping me with those, the contested and uncontested. Uh, matters and then the the adoption. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about open adoptions. Have you had any experience with open adoptions? I personally have not, but I do know of them. And 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 the most important piece of an open adoption is um, th that person, the the person who is is giving the child up for adoption, is is reserving their right to have communication with that child in the future. Um, those are tricky because despite, despite that um, willingness of the biological parent or potentially the child in the future, it, there will always be the best interest of the, of the child. That will always be the standard. So in the event that it's an open adoption and, and the court is petitioned for communication between the parties, the, the judge still has to take that into consideration before they make a determination. So the open adoption allows the biological parent, say, uh, to have the right to maybe visit with the child even after the child is adopted. Right, maybe visit, write letters. It, I mean, it depends on what the person is expecting. But and it's yes. in the best interest of the child. That's that's. Uh, People the forget that. The people forget that all the time. They right. they think that it's ironclad, but nothing is ironclad because when it comes to children, the court has to consider their safety above all else. Um, we are, I can see we're running out of time. I did want to get to adult adoptions, but I'll just say briefly that a, a, a person over the age of 18 can be adopted, uh, and the, generally the reason for an adult adoption is to uh, create rights uh, of inheritance for, for that child and for the parent. Uh, the parent also has rights to inherit from the child that they've adopted, but uh, that's something we can discuss at a later time. I want to thank everyone at home for tuning in. I want to thank uh, Carla for, thank for coming here and, and uh, spending her time and speaking with us this mm -hmm. evening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. It was wonderful. And thank you all uh, the, the audience at home for tuning in. I appreciate your, your attention. And I look forward to seeing you next month on the probate court and you. Mm -hmm.